Good morning. Glad to see all of you today. What a wonderful day of the Lord. Um, that he has gathered us together in his name to come and worship him as we go through the Bible. And today we find ourselves in chapter 9 of the book of Acts. So if you're following with us, please get your finger in that chapter. And then we shall pray. And before we pray also, uh, we are aware for those parents who have um, kids who are in school and they're doing their final exam, either it's a KCPE, KCSE, whatever the exam is, the end year exam, we will be praying for them that the Lord will give them remembrance of the things they have learned in class. Amen. Um, yeah, and it will be a blessing. Let us pray together. God Almighty, our Father and our Savior, we thank you. Thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. And we thank you also for gathering us together here in your name, Lord, as we uh, await of your return, Lord. We pray that you help us to be diligent, especially in the public reading of your word, and um, encouraging one another as we see those days approaching. We thank even for our children who are in school, who are doing their final exam uh, from this coming week, that, Lord, you give them remembrance and keep them in good health. Uh, sometimes the parents get worried about them, but, Lord, we ask that you'd protect them, Lord, uh, and be with them, Lord, as they will join us, Lord, for this uh, kind of long holiday for them, Lord, we pray that you'd give us good time with them, that we would disciple them, that we would encourage them and bring them to the ways of the Lord. And this morning as we go through your word, we pray that you sharpen our minds to receive and to understand that which you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a subject of a man called Saul, Saul of Tarsus. We'll read a few verses, actually only about nine verses for today, and talk about a few things. So if you have your Bible, let us read together. Then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Soul, soul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and, he, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was 
three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. This is a man that we, we have heard a little about him in the previous chapters. We did hear from shortly about him in Acts chapter 7 verses 58 and Acts chapter 8 verses 1. He was a zealous Jew who had been born in the city of Tarsus and grew up in Jerusalem. He studied under the best Jewish teachers, including the well-respected teacher called Gamaliel. We'll get to that in Acts chapter 22. Saul also stood in approval of the stoning of Stephen. And he went so far as to watch after the clothes of those who threw stones at Stephen. Following that time, Saul became zealous in trying to stamp out the group of the people who are called the way or the people of the way. At this early time, they never called them Christians. They called them the people of the way. You see, in this First verse, the Bible says they saw still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were off the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now consider this fact. He's been doing this in Jerusalem. He wants to bring people back as far as Damascus, bring them bound to Jerusalem. That is a long distance. Approximately it is over 300 kilometers from Jerusalem to Damascus. And this man wants to go get people there. (laughs) I mean, how many days is it? Is it going to take you, you know, you you have slaves, people bound in chains. How many days are you going to walk? Are you going to give them food? And what is going to happen during the day? Their movement movement is going to be slow. You know, what what are you thinking? What What is your idea? We see his, actually his idea is to eliminate them so that he remains to be Saul the Great. This Saul of Tarsus has encountered Jesus before in other forums. When Jesus was brought before Caiaphas to be questioned, Paul or Saul of Tarsus was there. When the apostle Peter and John was brought before the council, he was there listening. When Stephen was brought before the council of the elders, He was there and he heard all the preachings. He heard Jesus spoke and he heard these disciples speaking about Jesus and especially about the resurrection, which at this point, Saul of Tarsus believed that Jesus was dead and all about him is supposed to be gone. He's supposed to remain as the great. In fact, he's... Uh, teacher Gamaliel said that the only problem he had with Saul of Tarsus is that he didn't have enough books for him. He was a very brilliant person. And with that comes the ego of wanting to be the great above all. And now you have other people who are not learned, Many of them are Galileans, and these people, they're coming in, and they want to teach you the Bible. (laughs) They want to remind you of what is written. One of them who is a Hellenist, who is Stephen, gave them a little bit of a history from Abraham until the times of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end, he told them that you are a stiff.
always resisting the Holy Spirit. Do you think Saul of Tarsus is going to take it lightly? I suppose not. He wants to be the great. And we have people who are preaching marvelously, are preaching Jesus as the Messiah, are preaching that he is resurrected. And he doesn't like it. So the things that we are seeing here is that Saul is very mad. He's furious, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of Jesus Christ. In return, Saul is offending the Lord Jesus by persecuting his people. Who are these people? The people of the way. You remember in John Chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So by doing this to the people of the way, you know whom you're doing it to? You're doing it to Jesus. Who is the way? He said it, I'm the way. And I don't know why they actually call them the people of the way. Because they know. Jesus is the only way to the Father. No other. Not Muhammad, not Krishna, not whatever name, Smith and all these people. It's only through Jesus Christ that we have life. And though he continued to persecute these people, the more he tried to bring them to jail and to kill the believers, the more they grew stronger and stronger. What a weird, you know, way of thinking about it. You kill them and they grow. You kill them, they continue. And this was the quest And he went to the point of asking physical letters so that he can go to the synagogues in Damascus to go and bring them bound in chains to Jerusalem. People of the way. You know, following Jesus is not just mere words that people say. Following Jesus is a way of our lives and our beliefs. Whatever we speak should be consistent with our daily lives. We don't say this and we do this. We don't do this and we say this. It has to be consistent. That is why it was very noticeable with these disciples of Jesus Christ. They decided that it is Jesus all the way. And the Bible also tells us that he wanted to bring them to Jerusalem, whether men or women. I mean, what what is your intention? I don't know if they customarily did this before, just bounding, you know, people are believing what you don't believe, get them into chains and take them to prison. That is absurd that you would do that. And also by doing that, you, you, you kind of want to, to mess the plan of God by wanting to destroy men and women. At least they understood the definition of a man and a woman, Right? It is a man and a woman, not them, not they, not the craziness that we hear in the world. But, I mean, how low can you go to think that now, you know, uh, I I don't want to be regarded as this gender. (laughs) Uh, Call me them. Maybe it is right to call them them because they have legions in them. (laughs) They have demons in them crying out. (laughs) 
How many are you? We are many because we are legion. We are them. Anytime you hear, you know, people say, hey, call me them. Like, I know. <laughs> I know who is in you. It's not God. <laughs> them. It's crazy. And it's crazy how you see men, you know, men with beards wearing wigs. Ooh. Walking around like chicken. It's a shame. It's a shame to manhood. We, we, we are ashamed when we see other men trying to be like women. You know, men ought to be men. Women ought to be women. The way we relate with one another. Have you, 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 you'll find a group of men, actually the way we talk. We, we, we don't talk like facing each other like close. You guys know what I'm talking about? We talk shoulder to shoulder. Our focus is right there, you know? <laughs> shoulder to shoulder. We, we, women are, you know, that's a woman thing. You find men close. You know what you're supposed to do if you find men close? Just get your head together. <laughs> it will help them to separate so that they begin to realize who God called them to be. Let men be men. Let women be women. Don't try to be a man as a woman. It is not pretty. It's not beautiful. It is pathetic. <laughs> women are called to be women. Men to be men. That has nothing to do with this, but it's important. <laughs> he wants to destroy men as well as women. Wicked men to bring them to Jerusalem. But he did know the plans of God. So God meets the man. The Bible tells us in verses 3, as he journeyed, came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Soul, so, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Do you know what we see there? That Saul is receiving a revelation of Christ. The light is shining upon him that he's never seen before. This is in the middle of the day. And this light supersedes the normal. The light that shines above the sun, S-U-N, is the light of the sun, S-O-N, the Son of God. It supersedes what we have. This light, the strobe light that we have and the sun, bring all these things together. It does not come close that the than the brilliance of light that comes from the Son of God. And this is what struck this man, and he went to the ground. And he had a voice saying, Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? Listen, any time you are messing around with God's people, you're messing with God himself. You're messing with God's children, you're messing with God himself. And he will respond. He won't let you go. He will protect his own at whatever cost. So also. And even as we read from this, we can actually see or hear a voice of compassion also, saying, soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? Every time we hear Jesus calling out, especially calling people twice or by two, saying, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, how I wanted to gather you, but you wouldn't let me. Martha, Martha, 
so concerned about the things of this world. Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? You know, our, our African mothers, they don't call children twice. <laughs> if they call you twice, the third time you'll hear a sound. <laughs> Wema! Wema! <Pa! laughs> Accompaniment. It's important, no? <laughs> Here's soul goes to the ground first, is helpless, and then he hears a voice. So, so, why are you persecuting me? And Saul is perhaps thinking, man, how did I persecute Jesus Christ? How did I do it? What, what is happening right now? Is it, is it real what I'm hearing? What is happening? I don't know. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? That is one of the two great questions that we have in this part. That is question number one. Who are you, Lord? Then Jesus revealed himself to Saul and reminded him of what he is doing to him. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus. Pause right there. I am Jesus. But I thought you were dead. I'm Jesus. I thought this disciple was just speaking things that are probably in a trance. This thing ain't real. How is it possible that I can hear your voice? How is it possible that you're speaking to me, Jesus? I knew you're dead. How is it possible? It says, I am. I am. Saul of Tarsus is well acquainted with these words. I am. I am that I am. I am Jesus. I am the Lord whom you are persecuting. You raising your hand upon my disciples, upon the people of the way, you're actually doing it to me. You are persecuting me. Who are you, Lord? I don't know if any one of us, we've ever come to that point of asking, who are you, Lord? Or if people would ask, you know, who is this Lord to you? Do you know him personally? Or you just heard things about him? Can you defend his cause? You know, Stephen defended the cause of the gospel, the cause of Jesus Christ. He died. Before he died, you know what he said? I saw or I see heavens open. Saul is probably thinking, is it, he saw heaven open. He saw Jesus. Is this the same thing happening right now? You know, he's, he's a bit confused right now. He doesn't know what to do. He is a very helpless fella. Lord, who are you? Who are you? Have you ever asked? Or some of us would think it is a very unreasonable question to ask. Who are you, Lord? I want to know you. I don't just want to hear 
people testifying of the things you have done for them, I want to know you personally. I want to know you. It is, it is nice to hear from people. It is great. But I want to know you. I want to know you. Who are you, Lord? Say, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And then he says to him, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. <laughs> it's hard for you. It's hard for you, so you remember all these events. When you were, when I was taken before the, before the high priest, you were there. My disciples were brought before the elders. You were there. Stephen was brought before the elders. You were there. You saw him dead. In fact, you approved of it. You know that whatever he said is true. You know, this, the, the, the farmers used the goads to prick the oxen when they were plowing the land when they would try to relax a bit and it's still time, like they prick it and it will continue work. And the Lord is saying to Paul, hey, it, it's hard for you, right? It's hard for you to run away from this reality. Hard for you to run away from this truth that you have known. It's hard for you, right? And Paul is thinking, it's been hard. It's been a real struggle. Then he say, he trembled. When he heard these words from Jesus, he's wondering what to do. Trembling and very astonished. And he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That is the second question. What do you want me to do, Lord? I don't know if you have asked that question, asking the Lord what to do. Because he is always ready with things to do. He has a to-do list for you. <laughs> he, there was a to-do list for soul of Tarsus, even when he was on his way to go and persecute the church. The Lord was with him, walking, knowing his plans. And before he got there, things changed. Saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? And that's a good question that probably we need to ask the Lord even today. Lord, what would you have me do? What do you want me to do? It is very interesting also that the people that God is having them do stuff are the people who are already involved in things, whether good or bad. They're doing stuff. They're not lazy people. Saul of Tarsus was not a lazy guy. In fact, he was a tent maker. What do you want me to do? Saul immediately realizes that there might be a job for him to do. After hearing from Jesus, after saying, hey, I know it's been hard on you. You, you, you don't want to think about it. You have heard the whole history about the Messiah, about Jesus Christ. You have seen me. And now, here I am. You still want to say no? <laughs> what do you want me to do? Lord, do you want me to go to South Sudan? You want me to go to Palestine right now? You know, Kenyans, Kenyans joke a lot. They say, well, it's nice we were not taken to Canaan. 
we could be dead, all of us. Because there's a lot of fight over there. Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you have for me? Do you think he doesn't have stuff for you to do? You know, sometimes we hate to be told what to do. Why? Because we have our own way of doing things. I have my own way of doing things, so don't tell me what to do. This is what he was told. Arise and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. This was not an opinion. This was a command. Arise and go was the first thing. So when the Lord calls you, he tells you to do what? To stand up and go. Don't sit there. And people will be like, so Lord, I'm going, so how? <laughs> how? Have you provided the means? Have you prepared the way? Have you done this? And how do I know? Just, just, just lay a plan for me, Lord. I want to know it. Like, if not for a month, at least a few weeks. I want to know. I just don't want to go blindly. I want to know it right now. Do you know what you ought to know? Is to stand up and go. <laughs> Be on motion. Stand up and go. Arise and go. That was the first thing. And then you will be instructed on what you must do. You must. So by this he realized, hey, there's, there's, there's work for me to do. There's work for me to do. And there you're thinking, man, God, this, this man is coming to persecute you. He's coming to bring people back to Jerusalem. And you are sending this same man to go and do what? In fact, the people receiving him, they only received him because there was a vision. Otherwise, that was scary to meet Paul or to meet Saul of Tarsus. You want to meet a murderer? No. Saul was sincere in what he did. But he was sincerely wrong. <laughs> you know, many people will say, oh, you know, this, I, I'm, I'm sincere, bro. I'm sincere. It's, it, it's well. <laughs> you can be sincerely wrong. In your pursuit of things. He thought by trying to eliminate the people of the way, he's doing God a favor. He thought he was right, yet he was wrong, right? Well, I'm, I'm sincere. I don't know. <laughs> it's good to be sincere. But sometimes people are sincerely wrong in, in, in their belief system, in the things they choose for life. Sometimes they're just very nice in our eyes and we, we just want to do them because they're nice. But at the end, you know the Bible says what? There's a way that seems right to a man. But at the end leads to destruction. Seems right. Paul thought he was, he was right all this time. I mean, think about it. Knowing that this, this one event comes into your life and all of a sudden you, you're told you've been wrong. Everything you've ever known, everything you've ever did was not right. That was not the written thing. The written things are right because it's God who wrote them. The Torah and the things that they read. All these things were right. 
the prophecies about the Messiah and all this scriptural reading that Saul of Tarsus had learned. But the application was totally wrong. It doesn't matter how quick he was getting it. He was getting lost quickly and quickly and quickly. We don't like to be told what to do. Because most of the time, we think we know what to do. And instead, this is what we would rephrase it. That, Lord, what do you want them to do? What do you want her to do? What do you want him to do? What do you want them to do? Not me. I'm fine. I can handle my part of the bargain. I can do these things that I have. I know how to do them. It is easier to always point fingers at other people when the Lord is speaking. You know, have you, have you ever had a sermon somewhere, I don't know where, and you, you're wishing a friend of yours was in the room? this, I wish they were here today. Why? Because you think the Lord is, is going to use you to speak to them? <laughs> the Lord will speak to them through an angel, through a man, through the Bible, whichever way, the Lord will still speak to them. When the Lord is speaking to you, do not resist and think he's speaking to someone else. Did you hear that? No. You know what you ought to say? Did you, <laughs> did you hear that? Oh, my soul. <laughs> Don't be rebellious. Did you hear that? What is the Lord saying? The Lord is not asking them to do things. The Lord is asking you to do it. The Lord is asking me to do it. It is easier when it's thrown to other people. It's easier to, to send people to a war-torn situation. It is easier to say, well, I have this problem, so I can't go. You, you think we can advise the Lord on what to do? He knows way ahead of time. When he's sending you, he knows the dangers. When you know, you're being thrown in a lion's den. He knows that the lions exist. He, he made them. Him alone can restrain their mouth not to devour you. Or him alone can give you the strength to tear them apart. Who do you think God is? He's a lion and he's a lamb. You want who to lead you. You want the Lord to lead you, or you want to lead yourself? Arise and go. Then you must be told what to do. And then the Bible continues to say, and the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. They had a voice. They saw no one. That is another point to consider, that it is possible for people to be where Jesus is speaking and never have any encounter with him. Because we barely talk about this group of people. It is Saul of Tarsus and the, 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 the marvelous conversion. This is the conversion of Saul we are talking about. But then we have another group of people. He didn't walk alone. They, these were great men of war that he walked with. But this, when the light came, it did not struck this other man. It's only Paul, Saul of Tarsus. And then the voice 
was audible to all. But the thing is, the rest of these guys, they never asked the question, Lord, who are you? What do you want us to do? What do you want me to do? They never ask a question. It's interesting, right? Even in congregations like this one, we'll hear the Bible read to us. We'll hear God speak to our spirits, but still go home like that without a real encounter with our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a sad reality. And these are the group of people I want us to think about as we are ending. You know, they had a common mission to go and bring people to Jerusalem. I want to believe that their zeal was as quite as souls because, you know, as we're going down the road, Saul is, you know, telling them things and how they're going to do it. And they're, they're, they're gladly joining Saul to do this. And all of a sudden, the mission is changed. The way Saul got into Damascus was not the original plan. He wanted to come into this town with triumph, with, you know, the people should know that Saul of Tarsus is in town. Marching into the city and asking people questions. Are you of the way? Are you of the way? You of the way? You know. But little did he know that he was going to get inside this town not seeing anything. A blind man. You want to see glory. You want to see people applauding you. And then the Lord strips that away. You ain't going to see nothing, soul of Tarsus. All you're going to think about is the one who struck you on the way. He's the one who is going to instruct you on what you ought to do. How about that? And he was without sight and without food for three days. In these three days, he thought about Scripture over and over and over and over. And when that was done, he went ahead and preached the gospel. We're going to get into that next week. But just think about it. We have a group of people who walked with him, but did they encounter Jesus Christ the way Saul did? Probably not. In their way, were they asking, that, God, the, the same God who just appeared to, to Saul, can you have mercy on me? <laughs> can you at least visit me? I think I have a bigger problem than even this man. Maybe I have murdered people more than Saul. Maybe, you know, even my history is worse than this guy. Maybe I need salvation. I need you, Lord. Because sometimes we think that person who is getting born again right there is the worst of all. The rest of us don't need the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he's speaking, like, no, he's speaking, that's fine, but he's speaking to that person, not to me. Maybe he's calling out on you today. Maybe he's saying something to you. Maybe he's saying you have persecuted the church. It is not just about the killing. It is not just about taking people to prison. If you do any harm to the people who are called by the name of God, 
you are persecuting the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it. Are we all clean? Are we all in a place where we know for sure we don't need him? It's like, Lord, I'm good. I've, I've, I've known you for some time. I've, I've, I've read the Bible. I've, I've prayed. I've done this. I, I think I know you. I think I do. I only pray that you're not sincerely wrong. If you're sincere, I pray that you're sincerely right. Sincerely right. The Lord is calling unto us. The Lord wants us to make our path straight. He appeared to people. In fact, this same man says in 1 Corinthians 15, from verse 7, he says, After that he was seen by James, then all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out in due time. Jesus revealed himself to this man. You know the qualification for this apostle was those who physically walked with Jesus. They were with Jesus. They had Jesus. And he said at the end of it, Jesus himself revealed himself to him. Seen by me, I saw him. I saw him in the council. I saw him when the apostle preached in the council of elders. I saw him when I was on the road to Damascus. I saw him. Have you seen him? Have you? Has he revealed himself to you? And you know the way he reveals himself to us? Primarily, it's through his word. This word. This word that many of us repel. This word that many of us don't want to read. Or would read it when it's convenient, or we pray when we are in trouble. Other times, we are good. God, just deal with them. I'm fine for now. God, what do you want them to do? Not me. God, what do you want me to do? Or if you know for sure there's something already that God has called me, that has called you to do, are you doing it effectively? You need to ask for his strength to do it. God, am, am I doing it right? Am I doing my own things? Or am I doing what you called me to do? As I bring the worship team to come. The Lord is always at work. The Lord is always doing things. The Lord is always saving people, changing people's lives sending people to different locations to go do what? To be his witnesses. Are you a witness of Christ? It comes at a greater cost. Last week we just learned that a man was killed because he was witnessing about Jesus Christ. This man, as we continue to study we'll see that even his, now his friends will try to kill him. Why? Because he's preaching the gospel. And even the very, very early times, the people of the way were a bit skeptical about him. Is this the same man who came to bring people bound? He's right here trying to preach the gospel. He's, they thought it was a trick to gather people around, to get them gathered. And then when they're there, it's like, now that you guys believe, 
All of us, we are on transit to where? To Jerusalem. Because you're doing what the council said you should not do. Speaking in the name of Jesus Christ. Friends, sometimes we look for some, I don't know what to call them. You, we we kind of like want to be in a trance so that we can hear the voice of God. So that we can know for sure that He's speaking to us. God speaks to us every time. At our workplaces, He speaks to us. When we fellowship with our brothers and sisters, He speaks to us. When we read His Word, He speaks to us. But have you asked the Lord what He wants you to do? What can I do for you, my Lord? And perhaps you might be amongst the group who journeyed with Paul and you're saying, well, Paul said that, but I also want to say this with my mouth. I want to ask the Lord, would you save me? Would you come into my life? Would you speak to me? Would you lead me? Would you revive me? Would you, Lord? And you know what? He's always willing. And he wants to. His voice of compassion is calling unto us even today, saying, John, John, oh Mary, Mary. Whatever your name is, it's calling unto you. And he wants you to choose right, to be found under his feet, to worship him. I do not know your situation, but the Lord knows, and you know. All I want to do is to pray with us, so that the Lord will be gracious to us, because His grace has been poured for us today. For those who want to receive Him, for those who are saying, Lord, I want to come back. I was lost. I was a wreck when you found me. Sometimes we go about our businesses and we're not even looking for him. But his, his business is just there, coming after us. Do you think that is amazing? That Paul is going about his business to go and persecute the church and the Lord is just, I'm going to walk with you, bro. But you know what you're going to do? You're not going to do that. You're not going to persecute them anymore. In fact, you will feel the pain at a later day when you, you're stoned, left half dead. But he never complained. Immediately when the Lord called upon him, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Don't say, well, I haven't finished college yet. I still have my exams. In fact, next week, I have my exams. I have this going on. I'm engaged, Lord. Let me, let me at least come out of the honeymoon. <laughs> let me come out of Hawaii first. Then I will come serve you. Then I will come hear your voice. Let me go first. Let, let me go first to Australia. You know, I've realized many of us are going to Australia. <laughs> What's up with Australia? Lord, just wait just a little bit. When I'm done, I will let you know. 
you think you got that time? We do not, friends. The times are getting closer and closer. When we add a single day to our lives, no, the days are shortening, coming to a close. You want the Lord to return, finds you doing nothing? Whatever he wants to have you do, please do it. Do not hesitate. If you ask him what you want, what you want to do, he will tell you immediately. But don't say, well, I think my, fr my, my husband can do that. My wife can do that. I think the pastors of that church can do that. If he wants to speak to them, he will speak to them. So when you hear his voice, respond accordingly right let us pray god we thank you for the opportunity we thank you that you are good we thank you that there is no other like you we thank you that you are faithful above all else we thank you for calling us oh god we thank you that you remain to be faithful that above all else you are god thank you for calling us men and women to your service and if be there anyone amongst us today who has not given their life to you i pray that your holy spirit will convict them i pray for those of us who were drawn back that will be revived that you speak to us again that will pay attention to your voice again oh lord we know that you're here with us, speaking to us. And so, Lord, we pray that our hearts will not be hardened, that we'll not be a stiff-necked people, a people who are resisting the Holy Spirit. I pray that we'll be a people who will receive you with gladness, with joy. Oh, God, we ask of you that you will lead us to your paths and to your ways that are everlasting. Any resistance with us, break it, oh God. Break it. Soften our hearts so that we can receive you. And as we give to you this morning also, we ask that you soften our hearts to give that which will bring you glory. A gift that is worthy of your cross. We thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.